Good afternoon. I'm here to tell you how Dr. Seuss damaged engineering in the United States. Now let me start off by saying I love Dr. Seuss. One of the first stories I remember being read to as a child was Yertle the Turtle. And I made it a point to be the first story I read to my daughter, who's now five, and absolutely hates it because it doesn't have any princesses in it. I also remember using Dr. Seuss in my college admissions essay. Question, if you could have dinner with anyone living or dead, who would you choose and why? I remember writing, I choose living. Why? Because I don't want to eat with a dead person. <laughs> and then I chickened out and I wrote about Dr. Seuss. Why? Because he was one of my first educators and everything would rhyme at dinner. Now, I'm sure I wrote a brilliant essay for someone who really can't spell and whose third grade teacher, Mrs. Rothman, told his mom and dad at a parent-teacher conference, don't worry if he can't spell. He's good at math. <laughs> so, how did I come to the conclusion that it was Dr. Seuss that damaged engineering in the United States? Well, part of it was I had to give this talk. I had to find something I was passionate to talk about. I had so many options and my mind was spinning and then it struck me. I'm passionate and somewhat effective at teaching engineering, about making students think critically, work on teams, communicate, solve open-ended problems, use design, use science and math to alter the natural world, to make products and services that people want, to help people without harming the environment, or others, and maybe to make some money along the way. But there aren't enough of us. There aren't enough students going into engineering. That is the problem I need to fix. I need to change, but, but how? And how is this tied to Dr. Seuss? Well, the National Science Foundation, the American Society for Engineering Education, the National Academy of Engineering, and so many other professional societies, agencies, foundations, organizations, and other shuns have all made it a part of their mission to get more U.S. citizens to study engineering. And they're all failing miserably in their tasks. I can throw up a bunch of numbers and stats and figures and diagrams and tables and prove this, but I listened to several TED Talks about how you can use statistics to prove anything you want and do it very dramatically, so I won't. <laughs> so, why aren't kids going into engineering? What is it about the field they don't like before they even try it? How many K through 12 students actually know what engineering is or engineers do? How many of you actually know what engineers do? Engineering, it's, 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 oh, it's hard. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, oh, 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 it's math. That's another good one. Oh, oh, here's the best. It's sciency. <laughs> and then it struck me while watching an episode of The Big Bang Theory. <laughs> it's nerdy. So the question is, where did this term nerd come from and how is it influencing engineering? And, and, and again, how is this all tied to Dr. Seuss? Well, let, let's figure this out together. Let's start at present time and travel backwards and see if we can figure out how Dr. Seuss and the nerd damaged engineering in the United States. So let's start. Here we are today. TEDx Villanova U, you're here and hopefully you know where you are. That's good. Big Bang Theory premieres on September 24th, 2007 a show starring four nerds and a hot girl. A lot of my friends say I remind them of one of them. Hint, it's not the hot girl. There we go, a little bit. 1984, Revenge of the Nerds opens, one of my all-time favorite movies. 1977, Star Wars was first released, the first movie I actually remember seeing in the movie theaters. November 26th, 1976, the trade name Microsoft was registered with the Office of the Secretary of State of New Mexico. Bet you didn't know it was New Mexico. 1972, in New York City, 
the first Star Trek convention was held. The same year that Pong, the first commercially popular and successful arcade game was released by Atari. Coincidence? You decide. Go back to 1970s, where Arthur Fonzarelli, no relation to the Ponzi scheme, used the term nerd on happy days over and over and over and over again. 1965, in a student publication at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the term knerd or drunk, spelled backwards, appeared in print. And it meant to symbolize one who does not party, but studies. 1951, Newsweek magazine reports that the popular term nerd means drip or square. And finally, we go all the way back to 1950, to the first appearance of the word nerd in print, to my knowledge and that of Wikipedia as well. <laughs> that means it's true. And it appeared in a book entitled, If I Ran a Zoo, in which someone had to collect a Nurkle, a nerd, and a seersucker too for his imaginary zoo. The book, of course, was by L. Ron Hubbard. No, it wasn't. It was by Dr. Seuss, L. Ron Hubbard can't rhyme. So the term nerd came from Dr. Seuss and is one of the hardest things we have to fight against to get kids to go into engineering. We have to fight against this image, this stereotype. We have to fight the engineered. <laughs> Definition, engineered, a noun. An engineer who is a nerd, or a nerd who is an engineer. <laughs> or as some would say, a double nerd. <laughs> now, I believe we must change how engineers are perceived in order to get more of them so that we can get more iPads and iPhones and clean water and alternative energy and more solutions to the more complex and complicated problems we have and are still creating. Now, now, I was not the first to come to the conclusion that we need more engineers. One of my favorite studies was the Engineer of 2020, put out by the National Academy of Engineering. In this study, they lay out five goals for the engineering profession to help it change, to improve, to maybe solve some of its problems for the future. So here they are. Number one, we must agree on an exciting vision for the future. What is that vision? Two, we must transform engineering education to achieve that vision, to achieve an unknown vision. Three, we must build a clear image for the new role of engineers, a clear image for a new role of engineers achieving a vision which they don't know what it is. Four, we must accommodate innovative developments from non-engineering fields. I don't even know what that one means. <laughs> and number five, we must find ways to get the different engineering disciplines to work together towards common goals. These goals must much achieve this yet to be determined vision for the future that we don't know what it is. It took 101 pages to make these points. And all are probably very important, but I can't sell it. Like Dr. Seuss can sell a story, or Steve Jobs can sell a product, or Disney can use its Imagineers. It's boring. It's probably critically important, but it's boring. It's got no excitement, no pizzazz, no Nurkles or Yurt of the Turtles. It appeals to the engineer. I, I do kind of like it but I don't want to talk about it out in public at the neighborhood wine and cheese. But, but wait, I teach engineering, and therefore I can do some of this. I can transform and change the way I teach engineering. And then I can talk to my colleagues and say, you've got to change the way you teach engineering. And I can go to conferences and talk about all these great changes and write papers about all these great changes, but will that actually cause a change? Will K through 12 students actually know about all these great changes that I'm doing in my classroom? Will this change and fix the image of the engineer? I don't think so. Well, the next book to come out of the National Academy of Engineering was Educating the Engineer of 2020, or as will be done in Star Wars, book five, the second book. <laughs> now this book had 196 pages and 11 bullet items in its executive summary, but only one of these bullet items caught my eye and barely caught my eye. So here it is as a direct quote. 
the engineering education establishment should participate in efforts to improve the public understanding of engineering and technology literacy of the public and efforts to improve math, science, and engineering education at the K to 12 levels. That's it, that's the key. But not in the way it's written. Because it's even with my third grade spelling and punctuation knowledge, that has to be a run on sentence or something. <laughs> but we have to fix the engineered image. We have to make people understand, no, no, believe that engineers are cool, hip, hot, now, desirable. So that kindergartners want to go into engineering. So that my five-year-old, who no longer wants to listen to Yoda the Turtle, wants to be an engineer. So it is the profession. And then, of course, the math and science and engineering all has to be taught differently. Students need to see the practical applications and that engineering is everywhere around them and already a vital part to your everyday life. And then it'll be the cool, hot, desirable profession. But society, you and I and everyone in this room and everyone listening to this talk needs to change your perception, particularly anybody in high school where there's a very strong correlation between being smart and being a nerd, and an even stronger inverse correlation between being a nerd and being popular. Being smart seems to make you unpopular. Now, a change has already started to happen by accident without us, really to, without us really trying much. So imagine what would happen if we all put in the effort. We had Steve Jobs in his cool turtleneck, you know, selling one of those eye products Nobody needed one, but everybody wanted one. The gaming industry, it started out, you had to be a real geek, a techie, in order to play. And now your grandmother is playing. And the Nintendo Wii, and the Xbox Connect, and the Words with Friends, and whatever is next. What is next? What is the change we need to inspire? I don't have the total solution, but I know what the problem is. It started with Dr. Seuss, and it needs to end now. The engine nerd needs a makeover. We need to accommodate innovative developments from non-engineering fields. We need to make it the cool, hot, now, desirable, and unfortunately, I don't even know what the right cool word is to use, profession, so that everybody wants to be it. Those big glasses with the tape must be made cool. The acne and the braces have to be cover up and Invisalign. Those high flood water pants must be made capris. Remember, I do have a daughter. Smart must be made cool. Engineering must be made cool and desirable, hands on, practical, everyday life. Nerds, typically people who are unwilling or unable to follow trends, must set the trends. And then we must perceive that nerds and engineers can be kings of the pond. On a faraway island of Solomon Sand, Yordle the turtle was king of the pond. It was a nice little pond. It was clean. It was neat. The water was warm, and there was plenty to eat. But what should this little bored turtle do except jump on his iPad and look for a zoo? Or maybe he can play on his Nintendo, Xbox, or Wii and jump and save the princess like in Super Mario Brothers 3. He can think about quantum, the smart grid, and more. His fellow turtles might snicker and call him a bore, but those of us that are a part of that engineered crew know that one day this geek, this Nurkle, this king of the zoo, might be CEO, president, or chief of the board. I can't rhyme like Sue, so extension cord. <laughs> Being chief of the pond is not so absurd. The future must bring us the desirable engineered. Thank you. <laughs>